Okay, so good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, depending on where you tune in to this Tel Aviv University event. I am Udi Sommer from the Political Science Department and the Center for the Study of the United States at Tel Aviv with the Fulbright Program. Uh, I am delighted to open this webinar about the aftermath of the 2020 US presidential election, which is going to examine political, cyber, and strategic aspects of those consequential elections. Uh, the webinar is broadcast via Zoom, via social media, and also on the Jerusalem Post website. Uh, we have an exciting program, which is a product of a first and hopefully not last collaboration between multiple research centers and institutes at the Faculty of Social Sciences at Tel Aviv University. This includes the Blavatnik Interdisciplinary Cyber Research Center, the Boris Mintz Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions to Global Challenges, the Checkpoint Institute for Information Security, and the Center for the Study of the United States with the Fulbright Program. In, de in developing this program, we also benefited from our close collaboration with partners and friends across campus and around the world. That includes the Law School, the Faculty of Humanities, the Business School, and the offices of the President and the Vice President. Uh, it is my true pleasure to welcome Provost Steif to open the event. Provost Steif, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, evening, afternoon to everyone. Uh, I have to apologize in advance because I will not be able to stay for the entire event, but uh, it is an honor to be here. As director of Tel Aviv University, I put high premium on multidisciplinary research and collaboration between different uh, faculties and academic units. Uh, hence, it is my honor and pleasure to open this webinar, which is co-organized by three leading Tel Aviv University research bodies, the Boris Vince Institute, the Center for the Study of the United States, and the Yuval Neyman Workshop for Science, Technology, and Security. Uh, this interesting webinar will examine the implications and effects of the last U.S. presidential elections from several angles, policy, cyber, strategy, diplomacy. Of our four distinguished guests, I would like to extend special thanks to Professor Lee Epstein of uh, Washington University in St. Louis, who is certainly one of the most knowledgeable scholars of the U.S. Supreme Court, as, I, as I've learned. And uh, thank you, of course, thanks, of course, are due to our uh, own distinguished uh, faculty, Professor Rita Marabinovich, uh, Professor Itzik Ben Israel, and uh, Dr. Yael Sternhout. So I wish us all an enriching listening. Once again, I apologize that I will not be able to stay for the entire event, but uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Steif. And the nice thing about uh, doing Zoom events, I mean, we don't meet each other, but we, you can also always watch the recording. So that's that's the upside. Uh, and it is now my pleasure to welcome the head of the Boris Mintz Institute and Dean of Social Sciences, Professor Itai Senad, to give an opening statement. Uh, I'd like to stress that without Dean Senad's support, this event would not be possible. Dean Senad, thank you so much, please. Thank you so much to all. Um, this is indeed uh one of the things we wish to develop at the Faculty of Social Sciences. I cannot go on without uh, just a, a, a very few words uh, of thanks to Professor Liepsa and a very close friends for many, many years. Thank you so much for joining us uh, on such a short notice. I've also uh, just heard that uh, Professor Epstein will uh, enrich our students with a special seminar uh, uh, organized by the uh, Center for the Study, the, uh, Study of the United States, headed by uh, 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 Udi Sommer. Uh, Sommer or Sommer? I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, so uh, uh, thank you so much for doing that. This is really a, 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 an outstanding opportunity to, to have such a scholar uh, at, at this webinar and uh, uh, talking to our students directly on issues of the U.S. Supreme Court. So thank you so much. Uh, more generally, uh, uh, as uh, Udi uh, mentioned earlier, uh, this is the first, but definitely not the last. We are going to have uh, a few uh, uh, upcoming uh, such events. Uh, uh, one in March with our collaborator uh, 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 institute uh, from Kenya, the ICIPE, on uh, the evolution of sustainable agriculture and uh, some others still in uh, the making. Uh, it is 
I believe uh, we are getting close to the end of the uh, coronavirus uh, era and uh, the beginning of better times. But I'm sure that this webinar and other uh, new ways to communicate will stay with us and will really enable us to enrich our students which, uh, with uh, such uh, discussions of such outstanding scholars like uh, Itamar, Lee, Yael, and uh, uh, Itzik, who are uh, rare experts in the fields. And in the past, it was always somewhat difficult to get our students to listen to such an enriching discussion uh, so timely as we are just uh, concluding the actual events and getting ready to the inauguration of the new uh, uh, president-elect in the United States. So uh, given how excited I am about what is to follow, I will uh, stop here. Thank you all for coming. And uh, Udi, please continue with uh, the event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Senate. Um, it is a delight to have such a diverse panel to discuss the US presidential elections from various uh, disciplinary perspectives and viewpoints. We have no more than an hour and thus, while each of our panelists is an extremely accomplished scholar, I will introduce each of them briefly and by title only. Uh, I have a question uh, that I sent to each of them in advance. Uh, they will have approximately 10 minutes each to address. Uh, after their presentations, we will have, after their four presentations, we will have a brief discussion uh, on the panel. Uh, we will also make every effort to make time uh, to take a limited number of questions from the audience, uh, which you can enter uh, on the chat or the Q&A functions on your Zoom or social media interface. Um, our first speaker is Professor Itamar Rabinovich. Professor Rabinovich is the former ambassador of Israel to the United States and president emeritus of Tel Aviv University. Uh, Professor Rabinovich, thanks for uh, being us today. Uh, the Abraham Accords changed the status of the Palestinian issue. It further established and formalized regional alliances of Israel and the Sunni powers and backed Iran into a tight corner. Are the Abraham Accords a true paradigm shift? To what extent will they constrain the Biden administration's foreign policy in the region and force a thorough rethinking of the strategy from the Obama years? And since I sent you this question, little did we know that we were go also going to have the recent agreement with uh, Morocco, which might even further complicate the picture. We would love to have your insight on that. Yeah, thank you, Udi. So, um... Uh, President Biden comes uh, into office uh, next month uh, looking at the Middle East with uh, two legacies. Uh, one is of the Obama years where, when he was himself uh, vice president and very much involved with the policy and the, eight, uh, the four years of, uh, uh, of the Trump uh, period. And um, while uh, these two legacies seem uh, worlds apart and uh, they are in many respects contradictory, they have one thing in common. Both reflect Ted, uh, a tendency on the part of the United States to drift away uh, from the uh, Middle East. The term used by the Obama administration was to pivot away. Uh, of course, anything used by Obama would not be used by uh, Trump, so he did never used the term, but he also was interested in reducing US commitment, particularly the military aspect of it, in the Middle East, reflecting um, the de uh, decline of the uh, importance of the uh, oil industry and gas industry in the Middle East compared to uh, US own production, other technologies, uh, and so forth, and a growing concern with China is the main challenge uh, to the US, and hence uh, the view into the Pacific, Asia Pacific area. Now, uh, both presidents have dealt with regard to the Middle East with, with the following issues, uh, not necessarily by order of importance, but uh, say Iran, uh, the conflict with Iran and the quest to uh, deny Iran uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, second, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian issue. And third, uh, relationship um, uh, with the uh, conservative uh, 
traditional allies uh, of the United States and the competition in the region primarily with uh, Russia and uh, still on a, to a marginal scale uh, with, uh, uh, with China. Now, uh, Obama uh, very much wanted to uh, settle the issue with Iran diplomatically and the result was the JCPOA, the nuclear uh, agreement. Um, it was very uh, controversial at, at the time, as, as we know, was subsequently uh, the US signature or participation in it was uh, taken back by President uh, Trump. Um, second, with regard to the Israeli-Palestinian issue, uh, uh, President Obama tried very much himself at the outset and then delegated it to Secretary Kerry, who very much wanted to do it, try to negotiate a final status uh, agreement settling the uh, Israeli-Palestinian uh, issue. Uh, with regard to the uh, traditional Arab allies, a uh, problematic relationship, uh, President Obama never concealed his contempt for regimes like that of the Saudis and uh, ambivalence with regard to Mubarak and uh, so forth, the famous or infamous Atlantic uh, interview that he gave to Jeffrey Goldberg. And uh, <clears throat> with regard to the Syrian uh, civil war, the major issue of the middle of the previous decade, um, he very much did not want to be drawn in and um, I think his legacy will for years be marred by the in inadequacy or inefficiency of US policy uh, with regard to uh, the Syrian crisis, famously, most famously, the red line, uh, uh, line that he drew and Assad crossed and Obama failed to respond. Now, if we move to, to Trump, then he reversed the table with regard to Iran. He said, uh, came out of the agreement and, and now he uh, imposed sanctions on Iran, was trying very much to bring the Iranian regime to its uh, knees, saying at the same time that he was willing to negotiate, which the Iranians would not do. On the Israeli-Palestinian issue, he took a, a very pro-Israeli line. I would say pro right-wing Israel more than Israel in, in, in general terms. We all are familiar with the, uh, with the details. And uh, it culminated um, uh, with the Abraham Accords, uh, about which in a couple of, uh, a couple of minutes. Um, and of course, uh, he did not stand up to uh, the Russian competitor and it was under his watch that Russia came back in a big way by intervening successfully uh, in uh, Syria, then uh, in, in Libya. Russia has become much more of a player in, in the region as compared to the early years uh, of, the, uh, of the Putin, uh, uh, of the Putin uh, period. <coughs> um, and Trump's relationship with the Russia and Putin is, is very, very complex, moving from certain personal admiration, refusal, or I would say uh, difficulty to deal with uh, Putin given the uh, suspicions of uh, collusion uh, during, the, um, uh, during the US uh, elections. With regard to the traditional allies, he's uh, not particularly interested in the abuse of human rights and the absence of democracy. And typically for the uh, Trump years, a very personal almost family relationship uh, between uh, Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, and the two uh, MB, MBS in Saudi Arabia and MBZ in the, um, uh, in the Emirates. Now, uh, President Trump said from the outset that he would like to negotiate the deal of the century. I think he always wanted very much to receive a Nobel Prize. And I think that's where he saw a potential a Nobel Prize. And uh, his efforts in this regard produced, I would say, inadvertently, the Abraham Accord. I want to argue in the strongest terms, the Abraham Accord is not what the uh, Trump administration set out to achieve. It was an unintended consequence, but a very successful one. In fact, I think the only foreign policy achievement that uh, Trump can uh, uh, count uh, on his ledger uh, is uh, the, the normalization uh, process between Israel and 
uh, Arab countries, um, combining uh, a willingness to sell uh, F-35 uh, to the Emirates with an identif when, uh, identifying an opportunity. The Israeli pressure uh, or by Prime Minister Netanyahu to annex parts of the West Bank produced a golden opportunity for a, a deal. You get, you, the Emirates or the Emiratis, you get a um, suspension of annexation, you get the F-35 and I get normalization with Israel. That, of course, was a, a big change um, uh, in the Palestinian-Israeli uh, equation. The Palestinians realized, and I can say that also on the basis of discussions with uh, Palestinian leaders and activists, they realized that uh, they missed the train that the rules of the game have changed, that the Arab states are no longer going to wait for them and they have to adapt their policies. Of course, they wait for the, the Biden administration to come in. They already are receiving a, a better treatment. They expect maybe more and they will uh, uh, seek to maximize, but they understand that the uh, Israeli-Palestinian issue is not, not going to be first on the agenda, maybe number five or number six. Uh, an early quest for final status agreement is not on the agenda and they will try to get as much as they as they can. Where the um, incoming administra Biden administration does not, uh, <coughs> it does face um, a complex issue is with regard to uh, Iran. He does want to go back to the JCPOA. He does want to introduce changes in the agreement. I think they may have gotten the sequence uh, wrong they want to uh, come back into the agreement and then negotiate uh, Iranian concessions. I would say that anyone who graduated from the elementary bazaar knows that you actually do not begin by granting and then asking concessions, but you negotiate the concessions and then you add in what, what you're willing to grant. This is going to be a, a, a major issue uh, in the uh, coming weeks. The Abraham Accords, did not quite, uh, would he, I would say, push the Iranians to a corner. It's not good for them. They don't like to see countries in the Gulf allied with Israel. They understand that they may uh, face a, a more coherent anti-Iranian camp with Israel and several of the pragmatic Sunni states. That's not good for them, but they still do not feel that they are at the corner. In fact, they feel much relieved by the transition now from uh, Trump to Biden. Final word about Turkey. We speak about Iran, Iran, Iran. For many of the Arabs, including in the Gulf, uh, Turkey actually represents uh, a larger threat than uh, Iran. They look at uh, Turkey uh, in Yemen. They look at Turkey in uh, present militarily in Qatar. They look at Turkey in the Eastern Mediterranean and they are worried. So um, when the lines are drawn, it's not just the pragmatic Arab states, Israel and the United States vis-a-vis -vis Iran, but Turkey has to be put into the equation as well. I think I'll finish here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Rabinovich. First of all, for meeting the 10-minute uh, mark. And second of all, for the uh, very interesting insights. I was struck by the notion that the Palestinian missed the train. Uh, and I was wondering whether you thought there, were, there was another train on the way uh, uh, or not. And also, uh, by the fact that maybe the number one challenge for the U.S. foreign policy, the rising uh, power of China around the world, is something that might also have an influence right now, uh, less uh, uh, pronounced, but uh, might also have an influence in the Middle East. Uh, but uh, there, these are just thoughts that we might get back to uh, later on, and I'd be glad to hear your thoughts about that. Uh, thanks again. Uh, our second speaker, Professor Lee Epstein, uh, is Ethan A. H. Uh, Shepley Distinguished University Professor at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, Professor Epstein, uh, whereas Chief Justice Roberts made every effort to keep the Supreme Court out of the tumultuous politics of an election year, the Supreme Court repeatedly played a role. Uh, in your view, what effect or effects did the presidential election have on the court in terms of the court's composition, in terms of its recent rulings on COVID-19, which were in the news, COVID-19 cases, uh, and finally, uh, in terms of the public's view of the court. Professor Epstein, please. Thanks, Udi. 
Uh, hello from St. Louis. I want to uh, thank Udi and Itai Senate, my great and old friends, for inviting me to speak. And last but not least, a shout out to my folks who I think are watching from uh, Florida. Um, our presidential election, uh, to answer Udi's question, may have had at least two effects on the U.S. Supreme Court. The first concerns the court's composition and its decisions. The second pertains to its structure. Starting with the court's composition, here's our court three months ago on September 17th, 2020. I've ordered the justices from most liberal to most conservative. Note that all four liberal justices were appointed by Democratic presidents and the five more conservative justices were appointed by Republican presidents. Because it takes five, a majority to decide cases, it looks as if the Republican justices have the upper hand and so should prevail almost in all disputes. But that didn't happen in 2020 because the Chief Justice, John Roberts, as Udi noted, sometimes broke from the extreme conservatives joining the Democrats. That was true in last year's ordinary cases, as well as in many important ones on abortion, Trump's financial records, immigration, and gay and transgender rights. In each of these cases, the extreme conservatives dissented, and each was a loss for the Trump administration. But then, on September 18th, 2020, Ruth Bader Ginsburg died just 46 days before the presidential election. Now, the last two appointments to the Supreme Court, the Trump appointees, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, took 77 days from nomination by the president to Senate confirmation, which is about average. But in the case of replacing Ginsburg, the Republicans didn't have 77 days before the election. They had only 46. Not wanting to take any chances on the outcome of the election and certainly not wanting to miss out on the huge opportunity to shift the court to the right and make Roberts irrelevant, Republican leaders, notably Mitch McConnell, vowed to fill Ginsburg's seat. And they did so in near record time with Trump's appointment of Amy Coney Barrett. Now look what the Republicans accomplished. They replaced one of the most, the court's most liberal justices, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, with Barrett, who by all accounts is a rock solid conservative. Note too, that the center of gravity on the court has now shifted well to the right to the three Trump appointees, Kavanaugh, Barrett, and Gorsuch. In other words, almost overnight, the Roberts court morphed into the Trump court. And we in the United States are already beginning to see some effects. In July, 2020, when Ginsburg was still on the court, the justices heard a case out of the state of Nevada in which a church asked the court to block enforcement of the state's 50 person cap on religious gatherings. A sharply divided Supreme Court allowed Nevada to enforce its limit and refused the church's request. Note that Chief Justice Roberts joined the Democrats. But without Gore Ginsburg and with Barrett, the court didn't about face just last month refusing to allow New York to enforce a 25 person occupancy limit on attendance at religious services. The vote was five to four with Roberts now in dissent. This may just be the beginning. With Barrett, we may see changes in many areas of the law, religious liberty, of course, and also these. But may is the operative word Considering that we'll now have a Democratic president and possibly a unified Democratic Congress, the extreme conservatives could become concerned about moving too far too fast. Perhaps that partially explains the court's speedy and decisive rejection of Texas's request to throw out the election results 
in four key states. But why would the, the conservative justices be especially worried about overreaching in democratic regime? The answer brings me to the second possible effect of the 2020 election, the threat of structural changes to the court. Because of the rush to confirm Barrett, not to mention the Republicans' refusal to hold hearings for Obama's nominee, Merrick Garland, some Democratic elites and progressives have called for structural changes to the court. This is from the Democratic Party's 2020 platform. Top on the Democrats' reform list is to expand the size of the court, thereby diluting the rock-solid Republican majority. But Democratic reformers face a number of hurdles, not the least of which is public opinion. My colleagues and I recently fielded a survey asking Americans about their support for various court reforms, including expanding the size of the court. It turns out that only 26% of Americans favored the expansion proposal. This was true of Republicans, independents, and believe it or not, Democrats too. So this may not look like a promising picture for reformers who want to increase the court size. But to me, the ball is now in the Supreme Court's court. Should the extreme conservative justices make radical changes to these and other areas of law, they may give the Democratic Party precisely the fodder it needs to make the structural changes somewhat. We'll see. Thanks. Professor Epstein, thank you so much. Two thoughts that came to mind in your, during your presentation. Uh, I'll start with the letter one. So if FDR couldn't back the court, will Biden be able to? Uh, FDR being such a strong president, so popular with such vast majorities in the legislature. And the, th the second point, you wrote a lot about the, uh, the watershed event in the Robert Bork failed appointment, right? This was a point where the politics of appointments in the, in the Supreme Court really changed. I was wondering whether, as to your, maybe it's a little early, but as to your intuition, whether the Amy Coney Barrett is another watershed event. The music that you heard during the appointment process in the Amy Coney Barrett appointment to me was very different from the music that you were used to hear. Her, uh, the kind of questions that she was asked may, be, may have been similar, but her answers were much more direct and right to the point and much less, uh, 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 um, uh, I would even say that she's a very sophisticated person, but the answers were much less sophisticated than what you heard even in recent uh, cases, such as uh, uh, the Obama appointments and even the Trump appointments. I was wondering whether you think this was uh, uh, the, an another, you know, another, another major break in the, in the politics of appoint Supreme Court appointments in America. Um, our third speaker, uh, is Professor Itzik Ben Israel, who's a retired Major General in the Israeli Defense Forces. Professor Ben Israel is Director of the uh, Bl Blavatnik Interdisciplinary Cyber Research Center, the head of the Yuval Neyman Workshop of Science, Technology and Security at Tel Aviv University. Uh, Professor Ben Israel, cybersecurity and the integrity of the electoral process were key takeaways from the US presidential elections in 2016. This has been the topic of news coverage, of federal investigations, and congressional hearings for years after the elections. Yet in 2020, election officials have declared the elections, I quote, the most secure in US history, unquote. This is despite COVID-19 and the logistic complications that the pandemic entailed. So my first question is whether you agree. And my second question, if you do, what was at the basis of this phenomenal improvement? And is there an interesting Israeli angle here? Yes. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, you have to distinguish between certain levels of uh, trying to influence the elections by, by cyberspace. One is a little bit more technical. I mean, there are a lot of machines and computers involved in the uh, a chain of uh, voting uh, and, and those machines can be hacked and then some, even at the final stage when you take the, all the results and 
feed it into a computer and wait for the uh, summation of the of the votes, etc. Even then, someone could change the the software of this computer and and give you a false result. Uh, from the point of view of uh, technical hacking, etc. Uh, I think uh, um, uh, there was some difference, huge difference, I'll give you uh, one example immediately, between what happened in the previous elections and the uh, recent ones. And then you can say, yes, uh, uh, we did not uh, repeat the same mistakes that we did uh, four years ago. But there is another dimension which is much more complicated, and this is using what we call cyberspace, in order to influence people to vote in this way or that way. Now, this, this is something, a very old uh, phenomenon. You can read about it even in the, in the Bible. I mean, people use the technology of spreading rumors at the old time, okay? Uh, the same um, uh, FSB, same uh, 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 intelligence service of, of uh, Russia today, which before was called KGB, and when it was still Ukhrana, before NKVD, and before the revolution, before the communist revolution, used this technology uh, uh, of spreading rumors. At that time, you couldn't do it by tweeting. You had uh, to find uh, another way. By, by and the most uh, known examples that you all know about is they fabricated the, the, the protocols of the elders of Zion. And we all suffered a lot, a lot uh, out of this. And, and this was more than 100 years ago. Now you, it, it can uh, be done more easily because cyberspace enables one to, to do it. Still, the, the, it's not about technology, it's about influencing people, fake news, this, this informatia as the Russian uh, call it, etc. Uh, and this is something very difficult uh, uh, to handle. First of all, uh, it's very difficult, by the way, to change basic beliefs of people by fake news. Although people believe what they want to believe. I mean, if you want to take um, uh, uh, hardcore of voters of uh, uh, Trump and, and try to convince them to vote for, for Hillary Clinton or the other way around, it's very difficult. You can achieve very small percentage uh, of, of those who will change their minds on, on really uh, basic beliefs. I'm not thinking about uh, stupid things. Still, if you analyze the situation and, uh, and you concentrate only on those countries in which 1% here to 1% there may, may influence the number of electors that you have, etc., then you can do it. What the Russians did in the previous elections was not something purely this. They, they did something much more um, uh, uh, sophisticated and let me tell you uh, a minute what they did. First of all, they hacked into the computers of the, of, um, the Democratic Party and other leaders of, the, of this party, not Hillary by herself, but also other leaders. And they uh, uh, collected, copied a huge mass of uh, files from these uh, computers. Secondly, they handed it to the uh, media. Now, the media got this huge uh, number of files without enough time to go file by file and find what are the interesting uh, uh, files. They helped them. Now, in order to help them, they had, they had uh, collaborators, agents in the U.S. that uh, that uh, pointed to some files in the in the uh, huge set of uh, files, especially to false files, false files that were fabricated by the FSB and were put there mainly to emphasize the health problem and corruption problem of uh, uh, Hillary Clinton. These were false, but there was not enough time to check them and you know, go to the sources and, and try to see what is fake here and what is true. And, and therefore the media reported about them and this had 
uh, an influence. It had an influence, as I said, small one, but still it had an influence. Uh, uh, after the elections in the US, uh, uh, the, uh, there were elections in France, and we heard from the, the man who was the, the, uh, in charge of the digital campaign of, uh, president, of Macron, he was not president yet, uh, and he told us that he was afraid that uh, the Russians will do the same uh, uh, in France. What he did, I, I'm not sure, uh, excuse me if it's not legal, but this is what, uh, what he did. He, uh, he, he asked himself, how can I, I prevent it? Uh, so when it happened, I'll tell you immediately what he did. When it happened, and the Russian again hacked into the computers of, uh, of the uh, Macron's campaign and took those files and sent them to the uh, media. And when the media uh, asked for response, I mean, asked uh, him uh, to, to, um, to comment about it, he himself, I mean, Macron, through uh, uh, Munir Mahjoub, this is the, the name of the guy, he himself pointed to certain files that he himself planted in his own computer, which were false, of course, and very ridiculous in a way. Okay. Some of them had uh, comments in, in, in Russian saying, this is not a, something like, uh, we should uh, improve the, the style he doesn't sound original. Um, people will not believe it, and things like this. Now the media got, they, they got the whole information. They saw certain files there that, probably are not true, and they didn't know what to do, and they decided not to publish it, but wait for after the elections. Uh, this, by the way, tells you that even in the age, in the age of technology, creativity is still uh, something that can uh, uh, save you. Now, I'm, if you ask me about the second part of this, uh, uh, am I sure that, uh, that uh, it didn't influence the, the, the uh, fake news that we know that were spread through, through the cyberspace? Didn't it influence the voters? I, I cannot really assure this, but I know that um, uh, uh, because people, even to the, the uh, very possibility of fake news, people are much more aware of today. People, people are, uh, are not uh, taking uh, um, blindly everything they hear or see in the, uh, in the net, uh, networks, in all kinds of networks. And therefore, I think that uh, probably the whole assessment uh, that you uh, mentioned is true. Uh, now, Israeli side of it, I, I don't know what you meant, but uh, a lot of technology used here is, uh, comes from, from Israel, from Israeli cyber uh, ecosystem, but this is a, a topic for a different talk, not within the 10 minutes that you gave me. Thank you. Professor Ben Israel, thank you so much. Uh, and our last speaker for today, and we have, uh, I think, Ariel, her young daughter, with us. So that's nice. It really. No, no, she's expands. leaving. She's leaving. It expands the, all, the generational leaving. generational range of our uh, of our panel for sure. Um, so our last speaker for today is Dr. Yael Sternhall uh, from the Department of History and the Department of English and American Studies, and she's also the head of the American Studies program here at Tel Aviv University. Uh, so, Dr. Sternhall. Uh, President Trump did everything to undo the legacy, <clears throat> sorry, to undo the legacy of President Barack Obama, the first African-American president. He did so domestically and overseas. Further, uh, during his time, racist and, uh, and anti-Semitic uh, protests were uh, highly salient. African-Americans were pivotal in catapulting uh, Biden to the presidency, both during the primaries and then in the general elections. Uh, in your view, what should be the key elements in the agenda of the Biden administration in the context of race in America? Yes. All right, thank you, Udi, and thank you, everyone. It's uh, great to see you all uh, here uh, with us uh, in, in this event. 
spend. Um, so I titled my talk, The Biden-Harris Agenda on Race, or Where Do We Go From Here? And of course, Where Do We Go From Here is the title of Martin Luther King's 1967 book, um, K Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos Our Community. Um, which was not a successful book, neither commercially uh, nor critically. Um, the here that where we are at this particular moment, of course, is the aftermath of Donald Trump's uh, explosive presidency. Uh, and this is really one of the kind of the final scenes of the Trump presidency is a march of um, right wing activists. And these are particularly the Proud Boys, which we got to know during the campaign who uh, descended on Washington DC and set on fire Black Lives Matter um, signs uh, in churches and uh, raised all kinds of hell in a way that was um, pretty uh, difficult to uh, to take for uh, residents of, of DC. Um, so that's one here uh, where I think we are. And then the other here, of course, is the aftermath uh, of a year or a few months uh, during which the US was swept with protests uh, of a scale it has never seen before um, concerning um, social justice, racial inequality, et cetera, with, of course, the, the key term of, of this era and what perhaps is new and, and truly meaningful about this wave of protest, other than the kind of sheer scale, um, is systemic racism. Now, King was also very preoccupied with systemic racism um, towards the end of his life as he came to the realization that uh, as important as the achievements of the civil rights movement um, in the South were, they didn't really um, make a difference for African-Americans outside the South and that there were systemic problems uh, which Northern Blacks and Western Blacks were dealing with uh, that the right to vote or the end of segregation in Birmingham, Alabama didn't um, actually pertain to. And in this book, he uh, kind of laid out a, a series of ideas, um, including the idea that the Negro's problem cannot be solved until the whole of American society takes a new turn toward greater economic justice. And um, the question that King posed uh, in 1967 of how can that happen, how can that be done, in some ways is the same question that we're asking today. Um, and I would like to focus on the idea of the Biden-Harris administration turning towards greater economic justice, in particular as it pertains uh, to the problems of African Americans. It's kind of remarkable when you think about it that um, so much has changed, but also so little, right? That the, the question that he posed uh, two minutes after uh, the civil, the, the peak of the civil rights movement, uh, are the same questions that we asked, uh, that that we're still asking today, and that we're still kind of reconciling ourselves to um, at this particular moment. So, this particular moment is very much, I think, another turning point in the long battle for equality and opportunity for. Um, for all Americans. Um, and can the Biden-Harris administration make a dent in systemic racism? And can it in particular make a dent in um, uh, racial, racial inequality uh, in economic terms? And these are, these are the terms that I want to focus on. And uh, we're gonna take one measurement because we have 10 minutes, um, and that's wealth. Uh, so wealth is, is a much more important measure of um, economic inequality because salaries can be temporary, whereas wealth is much more permanent and uh, wealth is, is in some ways the future, right? I mean, the wealth of a household is the, the net sum of all its asset minus its debts. Um, so it's a, it's a much more meaningful figure uh, than just a salary. I know that for um, many um, folks in, in the States watching, uh, this is uh, all pretty obvious, but I'll, you know, I'll lay out a few uh, figures um, anyway. So this is the median net worth by race or ethnicity um, as in, in, during the period of 1989 to 2016. Um, and as you can see, it goes up and down, it fluctuates, 
but the result for 2016, which is the latest year for which we, we have figures that uh, we're confident about, is pretty much uh, 10%, meaning African-American households have about 10% of uh, the wealth of, of white households, um, 17,000 and change for uh, black households and 171 thousand um, dollars for white households. Um, it's a stupendous um, difference that almost goes without saying. And you cannot um, console yourself if you care about social justice, if you th don't think that a person's course of life should be determined by how dark their skin color is, um, by the fact that things are not actually getting better, right? So when you look at uh, change over time, you see that uh, 1989, it was 5.5%, meaning the, the percentage of, of black wealth vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, white wealth. And then it goes up considerably, 1998, right? It's kind of a peak year, 18.8%. And then uh, it starts uh, going down again. It basically collapses. I mean, you can just, just see African-American households collapse in the aftermath of, of um, 2008. And, and it's a long aftermath, right? Here we're in 2013, then in 2016, we're, we're not where we were yet um, before the, the Great Recession. So you can't uh, argue that, you know, things are getting better as, as, you know, time will solve everything. Time in and of itself doesn't solve anything. Um, time is neutral. Uh, the question is what happens over time? And in this case, uh, not much, as you can tell. Now, then another question uh, that's often asked about this when people try to argue that uh, all will be well in the end without any intervention from uh, the government and that market forces will write this is when you control for factors. So, College education for African Americans does something, but it doesn't do that much, right? So when you, when you look at uh, the net wealth of households, uh, black and white, without college, then it's, as you can see, the figures 81, 6, uh, 650 for white uh, households, and then for uh, black or African American, it's 9,000 and change. So college graduates obviously do much better for both groups, but you can see that the difference is still tremendous, as is the difference uh, in terms of the marital status of, of uh, the heads of the household, right? Another common argument is that because two thirds of black babies uh, are born to single mothers, then poverty is inevitable. But uh, okay, what happens when uh, couples are married? I mean, does that close the wealth gap? It makes things better for sure. Two salaries are better than one, but it does not close the wealth gap. And things are pretty much stable. We are not seeing change over time. And we are not seeing the factors that are normally associated with um, greater wealth per household actually making the kind of difference that you would think uh, they might make. Now, the reasons for this are uh, well known, I think, to all of us, uh, starting from the fact that African Americans could not uh, get mortgages for decades on end, uh, even in uh, ostensibly liter liberal locales like New York, Philadelphia, um, Pittsburgh, Detroit, you name it. Um, there were mechanisms in place that prevented them from home, home ownership, which is the single most important vehicle for wealth accumulation in the United States. Um, that's one factor that uh, I think we're all aware of. Another factor is that African and American neighborhoods in which more than 10% of the residents are black uh, tend to experience uh, a drop in real estate values, which is of course, um, it's, it's really quite a remarkable figure because it marries the cultural and the material, right? And the question is what leads to what? Um, how do people's cultural uh, ideas of African-Americans factor into real estate uh, prices? And then how does that process um, uh, work the other way around? But the figures are pretty objective. You know, it's as, as good as, as numbers as we can get. Then there are the, you know, the, the intangible factors, which we're also aware of the fact that let's say when a white applicant and a black applicant with identical qualifications um, apply for a job, uh, then uh, the white applicant has a 36% uh, chance uh, more than a black person of getting a callback. 
um, employers are scared of African Americans and they're scared of African American men in particular. African American men have the added burden of mass incarceration since uh, the percent, the, 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 the number of African American men, uh, or let's put it that way, an African American man, man has um, six times the chance of a white man to spend time in prison, then uh, not only are the years he spends in prison uh, are wasted years in terms of wealth accumulation, also the rest of that person's life will be shaped by um, that time that they spent in prison and what it will mean for their employment prospects. So there are a host of factors and reasons. I, I've named four, you can probably find 40, but the result is the same. And I'm wondering um, in the spirit of Martin Luther King, whether the Biden-Harris administration uh, would be able to take this particular problem on? And what are the policies that the Biden-Harris administration might want to implement in order? Um, I'm not talking about resolution. I'm talking about making a dent. I'm talking about a set of policies that could actually make a difference in less than 200 years, which is, by the way, the exact number that experts put on how long it will take to close the wealth gap without government intervention. Um, okay, so this is a, a as, Dr. Sternhal, one, one minute left, okay? okay, sorry. Yeah, so, okay, policies. Um, encouraging home ownership is key. Um, you know, I, I put Mitch McConnell here uh, just as a, as a way to uh, um, uh, highlight the, the, the point that uh, Biden and Harris and their entire huge and powerful administration are not alone here. Um, home ownership will reduce uh, the wealth gap between blacks and whites by 31%. So that means making a dent, right? That means making a serious dent. Um, deal with housing segregation, meaning deny funding to communities that are not able to show that they have lowered their rates of housing segregation, put real penalties on communities that perpetuate the habit, the practice of, um, of, of denying African-Americans uh, the ability to move in. Um, reduce black people's debt load, um, for example, from predatory mortgages, from student loans, from car loans. This is something that often goes unacknowledged, but both whites and everyone in the U.S. has a lot of debt, but blacks have more expensive debt. A car loan is a more expensive form of debt uh, than a mortgage, and, and African Americans are unable to save because they are married to these highly unequal forms of debt. Um, improve access to retirement savings. A lot of African Americans do not have retirement savings because they don't work in jobs that um, offer them uh, th this basic right. And what can the federal government do in order to make that happen? Um, and then um, the last thing that uh, the people who specialize on in, in these areas uh, claim could make a real difference is improve access to banking, and to community financial resources, meaning the cornerstone store doesn't need to go to Bank of America to get a loan. It could get a loan from a local institution that would be sensitive to the needs and, and difficulties facing the owner of an African-American um, store owner. Now, I'll say one more thing, Udi, and give me- Really uh, briefly, please. Whenever the topic of, uh, of, of the, the economic inequality comes up, especially in recent years, then, you know, the word reparations um, sort of bursts into the scene and, and I think makes uh, a lot of people unable or unwilling to listen. But none of this requires what we think of as direct reparations. And of course, all of us in Israel know exactly what direct reparations mean because we have enjoyed so much of it uh, from Germany. But most of this can be done through federal policies that the federal government has enacted uh, the okay. likes of which in the past. And so it doesn't require any radical step. It really requires just focus and political will and a historical recognition of what's at stake. Fantastic. Dr. Sternholz, thank you so much for this uh, uh, spirited argument.
And uh, I would like to integrate some of the questions that we're getting from the audience. Uh, I'll ask a question of uh, uh, Professor Rabinovich, Professor Epstein, and Professor Ben Israel, uh, uh, one each. And if you can answer in around uh, uh, 30 seconds or maybe a minute, this would be great. So Professor Rabinovich, uh, you said that the Palestinian missed the, missed the train. Is there another train coming or are they going to stay <laughs> in the station? Uh, yeah, a subway. Uh, a train that doesn't go uh, all the way. I think if the uh, sense of realism that I detected materializes and the Palestinians would be willing to accept interim agreements uh, at this point, uh, they would be uh, accomplishing much. They would be uh, actually putting an end or at least a stop to the process of creeping annexation or drift towards one state with that that we have seen. They up, up until now categorically refused to settle on anything less than the final status agreement. If they are lowering their size, if they lower their sides, they are likely to do better. So lowering the expectations, lowering the stakes, this would be uh, is what made Mike help. Wonderful, thank you, uh, Professor Epstein. Uh, do you buy the argument that this is we we went through a watershed event in the politics of appointments with a uh, uh, Amy Connie Barrett's uh, appointment, or do you think this might be an aberration uh, and we're going to go back to uh, uh, to uh, the standard? You know, on the one hand, Udi, the evasion and sidestepping that you mentioned has been a part of Supreme Court confirmation proceedings since Robert Bork in 1986. He said too much. Nobody wants to say much. I think you're right, though. No offense to Amy Connie Barrett. She is her answers were in some ways rather pedestrian, in part because her background is pretty straightforward. She was a law professor. You look at someone like Elena Kagan. Yes, she was a law professor, but she was dean of Harvard Law School. She worked in the Clinton White House as a domestic advisor, and she was Solicitor General of the United States. Much richer background on which to draw. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And Professor Ben Israel. You basically, basically talked about a triangle of effects, right? You talked about the elites, you remember the Macron campaign and the DNC. You talked about the public, the fact that the public becomes much more sophisticated. And you talked about technology very briefly at the end, suggesting that there's much more to say, but we're, uh, we were out of time. Out of those three elements, if you are thinking about the, the, the improvement from 2016 to 2020, where would you put uh, uh, the most, uh, uh, which of those three uh, uh, corners of the, uh, of the uh, or three angles of the triangle would you think was the most important? The elites, the public, or the technological advancements? Uh, you are muted, Itzik, you are muted. The one which uh, was uh, more improved than the others was the technological. There was certain improvement also on the psychological influence of uh, uh, fake news because people got used, it's like the COVID. I mean, the more you are hurt by the disease, the more immunity we have at the end of the day. Uh, people are more immune today to fake news than they were five years or 10 years ago. Uh, if you ask for my opinion. No, you are fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, I was fantastic. Thank you so much to all of you. Uh, Dr. Sternhall, you took a little extra, so I'm not going to take the advantage of asking you another question, but it was fascinating. Thank you so much. And I would like to uh, ask uh, uh, Dean Senate to uh, give us his uh, final thoughts and concluding remarks. Thanks. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a, a, a great pleasure. Uh, very interesting. Uh, definitely uh, uh, standing up to the uh, high expectation we had. I do want to uh, thank uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Boris Smith for his generosity, without which this would not uh, uh, have been possible, and his support uh, over the years, and his uh, genuine interest in this kind of events uh, that is so uh, uh, important uh, uh, to us. And uh, I do alert you to the fact that we will keep this as uh, Udi uh, suggested at the outset and uh, are looking forward to have uh, the entire audience 
uh, in our uh, forthcoming event. Uh, in particular, I would like to highlight uh, uh, a planned event uh, to happen in March uh, in collaboration with our uh, 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 wonderful uh, sister institute in uh, Kenya, ISIPE, uh, on the issues of sustainable uh, agriculture and sustainable uh, economics. Um, ISIPE just won one of the most prestigious uh, uh, awards for uh, its uh, um, uh, contribution to this issue. And we do have actually Dr. Uh, Sagan uh, with us this evening. So uh, thank you everyone. Uh, looking forward to meet you in the next uh, event. And uh, it was really, really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.